Hello everybody, today I'm visiting the University of Oxford where I'm talking to Zubir Zakhar, um, who's a professor for theoretical physics. And I've told you about him before because he wrote this paper about the supernova data um, that may not provide the evidence for dark energy that we thought it was. Um, so maybe we can start uh, with that. So uh, in 2011, a Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, the discovery of dark um, energy based on the supernova data. And you and your group, you have been reanalyzing this data and, and think that this claim does not hold up. Maybe you can briefly summarize what you've found. Uh, well, this now goes back uh, over 20 years. So let me try to recap the situation. Well, first of all, the data that you referred to was made public uh, only in 2014. Uh, that is to say, in a, a way that uh, enabled other people to analyze it. And uh, the first thing that we did was to notice that uh, in extracting cosmological information from the data, in fact, the statistical analysis that was being done was not what one would call principled, in the sense that it was assuming the model that they were actually meant to be testing. So there is an error bar added to each data point which is adjusted until you get a good fit to the assumed standard model of cosmology. So this is perfectly okay if you want to estimate parameter values, but it is not really right for uh, model selection. So our first step was to use uh, a principal statistical method this is called the maximum likelihood estimator. It's industry standard. And using this, and in fact, this work was done essentially by my then master's student at Copenhagen, uh, Jeppe Nilsson. Uh, and my other author, co-author was Alberto Gufanti, who is actually somebody who works with pattern distribution functions, but he's a statistical expert. And we established that, in fact, the evidence for acceleration in the data was marginal. It was far short of the five sigma that you would expect for a discovery of fundamental uh, importance. It was in fact less than three standard deviations. So that was uh, our paper in 2016. And uh, in fact, it was rather a surprise to us that this was actually the very first time that somebody had in fact looked at the data and the analysis uh, in detail. Uh, partly this is because of what I said earlier, that the data had simply not been available in undoctored form. This is the important thing. And we are very grateful to the so-called Joint Likelihood Analysis Collaboration, uh, which essentially included every supernova expert in the world, including the Nobel laureates. And they made their data public, and I think that is a very healthy thing to do because it means other people can independently uh, re-examine your analysis and uh, to that end we simply wanted to emphasize that the evidence is uh, not as strong as it should be but this created a bit of an impact and uh, got us going on trying to look at the data more closely and this analysis we had done had been uh, using exactly the same cosmological model as had been adopted by uh, the previous authors. In other words, something which is assumed to be isotropic on the sky. Um, we had uh, wanted to do this in order to enable comparison with the previous results. So that, that was the 2016 paper, Precisely. Right? Yeah. So subsequently, uh, we had also been doing other work. I was involved with another group of uh, astronomers. Uh, this is Roya Mohai and Jacques Collin, who were at the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris, and uh, Mohammed Ramiz, who was then a postdoc with me in Copenhagen. And we had been actually looking at something which is not directly related to the supernovae, but reflects on the underlying assumption of uh, isotropy. And that has to do with the following that in fact when you look at the sky, it is not isotropic. Uh, the cosmic microwave background, which is the information that you get from the deepest point in the universe, has a very pronounced dipole anisotropy. And this has been known for, you know, since almost the beginning of the 
the discover uh, shortly after the discovery of the CAB. Now, uh, this is attributed to the fact that we are actually not in the so-called cosmic rest frame. We are moving locally um, due to something pulling us. Now, this is not unusual. I mean, if you look, for example, at nearby galaxies, uh, they are again, our Andromeda is actually falling towards us. It's not going away from us in the Hubble expansion. However, these motions are meant to be local. So if you average over a large enough scale, they should disappear. And you should then so-called converge to the frame in which the universe looks isotropic. And uh, therefore, the original standard model of cosmology, which assumed exact isotropy and homogeneity, has been, if you like, uh, uh, improved to take into account that actually the present day universe is on inhomogeneous. And the statement is that, yes, it is, but that is only on small scales. If I average over large scales bigger than 100 megaparsecs, and a megaparsec is roughly the distance to Andromeda. It's actually 0.8 megaparsecs. So if I average over a scale which is like 100 times bigger than the typical intergalaxy separation, then I should arrive at that idealized framework, which is the usually assumed uh, theory. So, so that's an assumption that people made at the That's start. right. However, we uh, wanted to test this by looking at the uh, anisotropy in similarly distant uh, astronomical sources. So there are radio sources which are at high redshift and they have been catalogued from the very large array in New Mexico. And uh, in the, it is known that if you move with respect to a uniform isotropic distribution of sources, the first effect you should see is called aberration, just like aberration of starlight, which was in fact uh, first discovered by Bradley, who was a professor here. And uh, you also have the Doppler boosting of the frequencies of the light. So if you're looking at a distribution of sources whose fluxes uh, the numbers depend on the flux, then you have to allow for that. And all this had been computed long ago. And uh, you can therefore, by simply counting how many sources are there, let's say in one hemisphere versus the reverse hemisphere, you can work out how fast you're moving mm -hmm. with respect to them. So when we did this exercise, uh, we found that the velocity uh, was in fact in the same direction as the CMB dipole but it was four times larger, okay? Now, actually, we are not the first to find this. A radio astronomer called Singel had already uh, said this some years earlier, but he had not been taken seriously because uh, he was looking at a catalog that was made from one point in the Earth, so it was not full sky. And there was a concern that uh, if you had very nearby objects that they can give you an artificial dipole in the sky which is not reflecting these effects that I mentioned earlier. So when you talk about these radio sources being at high um, redshift, uh, just what do you mean by high? Are high means two, uh, three or something? Well, they're more than one. The truth is okay, that most of one. these redshifts have not been measured. They're <laughs> yeah. just point-like sources on the sky. So they are taken to be at high redshift. But we, in fact, uh, did something novel, which had not been done earlier, we cross-correlated that catalog of radio sources with a catalog of objects measured by uh, in the so-called Tuma survey. These are uh, mm -hmm. mainly uh, nearby galaxies, infrared emitting galaxies. And anything that was in common between the two catalogs we threw out. So we therefore ensured that the objects we are looking at are actually distant. And we could remove the possibility that uh, just by chance there happens to be a radio source quite close to us, which would then give us an artificial so-called clustering dipole. We are interested in the kinematic dipole. So we did this analysis. We obviously satisfied the referees that we had done it properly. We removed the you know galactic plane and other such possible sources of contamination. And we confirmed Singles' result. Now, we had in our catalog, uh, something like 800,000 galaxies, because we had to throw out quite some of them in order to make sure that the catalog was clean. Uh, 
but we had also combined them with a catalogue made from Australia to cover the missing part of the sky. And in total, it came to less than a million. Now, I say that because if we then calculate by Monte Carlo techniques, what are the odds of finding a dipole which is as high as we found purely by chance, by fluctuations? Well, I could say that in different ways, uh, but I could express it in terms of sigmas, which is something that particle physicists understand, and it's actually less than three sigma. Okay. So in other words, although it's a very striking result, it's not convincing for the same reason that I gave earlier about the supernova data. We need, you know, 10 times, 100 times that number in order to do this job properly. And the good news is that that will happen because the square kilometer array, which is currently under construction, will be able to give us uh, a much, much bigger catalog of radio sources. And indeed, this is one of the tasks that uh, we uh, know that they will carry out. But even in the slumped down version, I, I read they have some well, trouble getting funding. That's true. There are issues and in particular, Germany has, I believe, dropped out of the mm. square kilometer array. So Dominic Schwartz at Billefield, oh, who I is uh, uh, involved with the SKA and who is very aware of this result because he had also independently looked into this radio uh, source dipole. Um, he has been, I know, pressing for uh, this to be a flagship uh, project in SK because it's a simple thing to do. It's very, very model independent. Um, of course, you have to, in, in, in practice, you have to allow for all kinds of biases and so on, which we do. But uh, it, it's a easy to intuitively understand what is going on. So what, what would it mean if the velocity that you get from that kind of measurement does, is four times larger than the other well, one? Well, that means that the CMB dipole is not kinematic in origin. Uh-huh. Okay. Right? So in other words, all we see is a dipole. The interpretation is uh, based on a model. And if the CMB dipole is not entirely kinematical in origin, then it affects the usual analysis of cosmological data, which mm -hmm. always assumes that by making a special relativistic transformation, see, yeah. we can boost to the frame in which the CMB is isotropic and therefore the universe is isotropic. And we can use the same equations of, uh, you know, Friedman, Robertson, Lemeth, Walker cosmology, which were drafted, you know, nearly 100 years ago. So this is rather important. Now, when we found this odd effect, we also, uh, in the process, established uh, essentially by doing tomography. So what we did was to take a catalog of uh, galaxies which had their redshifts measured, they harbor supernovae. So actually, we are grateful to the supernova discovery for having uh, provided the resources necessary to, you know, get more data, because that's important. People keep saying there's an avalanche of data, but if you actually start looking closely at it, there isn't really as much data as one would like. It's nothing in comparison, cosmology, the data is nothing in comparison to particle physics. Absolutely. And the other uh, uh, difference is that in particle physics, if you don't have sufficient data, you will soon have it. You don't have to do uh, calculations of, you know, look elsewhere effect and so on. You just get more data and you know whether that little nascent peak is actually the Higgs or not. Right? In cosmology, it takes much longer to get the necessary data. So anyway, uh, to come back to what I was saying, uh, we had established by doing tomography of the uh, local Hubble flow mm -hmm. that there is actually a dipole in the supernovae themselves. This was in an earlier catalog called Union 2, uh, which had uh, fewer galaxies, uh, fewer supernovae, host galaxies in them. But that was enough to establish that uh, there is, in fact, a dipole in the supernova distribution, in, again in the same direction, with, but much more uncertain, within about 30 degrees of the CMB dipole direction. And uh, what, however, we could establish was that this uh, flow, or whatever was causing the dipole, extended much beyond a 100 megaparsecs. Mm -hmm. It, in fact, went out to the so-called Shapley supercluster, which is at something like 260 megaparsecs. And uh, 
Subsequently, another group called the nearby Supernova Factory, who are professional astronomers, in fact, they're led by Saul Perlmutter, they uh, did the analysis, the same analysis on their data, and they showed that the flow, in fact, extended past Shapley, even deeper. Okay. Uh, okay, so so to, to tie this back together with what you said earlier, it means that this assumption that we're converging to this cosmological rest frame at something like a megaparsec is just wrong. It's at, much, at 100 megaparsecs, yeah. It's, it's definitely beyond 100 megaparsecs. Yeah. So this is all rather puzzling. But what it meant is that we uh, are in this peculiar flow, this non-Hubble flow, and that it extends out much further. Now, this is a very tricky measurement because in order to do this, you have to have independent measures of distance than the redshift. And measuring distances is the hardest thing in cosmology, in astronomy in general. So the way this has been done is by using other empirical properties of galaxies. There is uh, the Tully-Fisher relation that you know about, which is an empirical correlation between the speed with which uh, spiral galaxies are rotating and their luminosity. There is similarly something uh, for elliptical galaxies called the fundamental plane. And using these techniques, you can measure distances, but not very precisely, perhaps to about 10-15%. That's about the level of accuracy. But uh, recently, uh, a survey that has been done from Australia, the so-called six-degree field galaxy redshift survey, has measured the peculiar velocities of 11,000 galaxies, which is really the biggest sample uh, to date. Now, I'm not sure the authors will uh, ever claim that this is the last word, because that is still a small patch of the sky and uh, you really need to do a bigger sky survey to be sure that this, uh, uh, to, to get more data and to confirm this conclusion. But what they are uh, showing is that our initial uh, assessment that the flow extends deeper than expected is in fact correct. Mm -hmm. Their error bars are a lot smaller and clearly discrepant with the usual expectation, which is the standard model of cosmology, that the growth of structure is from small fluctuations that we see imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. And this has happened just through gravity, so you can compute it using linear perturbation theory. And the expectation then is that uh, you do have structures today, they have gone nonlinear, you see the complexity of the galaxies and the clusters and superclusters and so on. But when averaged over scales bigger than 100 megaparsec or so, you should be able to recover the underlying simple model. That is the basic uh, presumption. Now, all these things that I'm talking about make one question these presumptions. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't really know why we are flowing at these speeds, why the flow is extending that deep. These are issues that we can talk about separately. But they immediately impact on how the data is actually uh, treated or processed in order to draw cosmological conclusions. And here we find that uh, the supernova data, the supernovae uh, host galaxies also have peculiar velocities, about three quarters of the ones in the JLA catalog, there are 740 of them, three quarters of them are within this bulk flow. So to, to briefly summarize this, you reanalyze the supernova data without this assumption of convergence to the cosmological average uh, at 100 megaparsecs. That's right. So we are uh, analyzed, we decided to go back to the uh, analysis that had actually been done in the first papers, mm -hmm. which was simply looking at what is measured in our frame, in the heliocentric frame. Well, obviously you make corrections for the fact that the Earth is going around the sun and all that but it's a heliocentric frame. And uh, we undid the corrections that had been made for mm -hmm. peculiar velocities because we found them to have been done uh, using rather out-of-date flow models and also done in an inconsistent manner, in fact, unphysical. So it's a technical term I have to use here, but if I tell you that the covariance matrix for the peculiar velocities had large negative terms uh, in the, in the off-diagonal elements, uh, this makes no sense whatsoever. They have to be physical, they have to be positive definite. So essentially, um, we dug down into what had been done 
and found that uh, we are not quite satisfied that it had been done in an appropriate manner. Okay, so so you, you, you got the data and ha actually had to undo the corrections that had already been done. Precisely. Okay. To, and then when you look at the, so we put ourselves in the position of what if we had uh, this big data set, but we are now, let's say, wind back 20 years, right? And we are doing the same analysis and we examine whether there is acceleration in the expansion rate, but we now do it dropping the assumption that it's isotropic on the sky, in other words, that the directions of the supernovae don't matter. We drop that assumption. We take that into account. So now when we look for a direction dependence in the inferred acceleration, we found to our great surprise that it is almost entirely a dipole. The universe is accelerating locally in one direction and uh, decelerating in the opposite direction. Right? And this direction is pretty close to the CMB dipole. It's within 23 degrees. And I want to emphasize that uh, I should not use the word universe here. We are talking about what we actually observe and what we infer from that. This does not mean that the universe has an axis. It means that the sample of supernovae that have been so far observed, if analyzed without any presumptions, they show this dipole. What one makes of this is another matter that I'm not commenting on here. I'm making this comment simply because a lot of people uh, immediately get very concerned that, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine how the universe could have some axis uh, and how one could have a directionality in the metric. We certainly are not talking about that. We are simply talking about what we observe. It's very much uh, empirical. So when we found this, we uh, also, of course, uh, pointed out that the monopole in the acceleration, that is to say the isotropic component, was consistent with being zero at, uh, you know, at 1.4 sigma or so. Now, the interesting thing is that if you were to uh, ascribe this acceleration to a cosmological constant, interpreted it as vacuum energy, it would have to be isotropic. So in other words, the evidence for an isotropic acceleration is non-existent. And it is this that has made a major impact, not just on cosmology, but also on fundamental physics. For example, you are aware that this whole recent controversy about uh, the swamp plant in string theory mm -hmm. is based on whether we have a cosmological constant in the background or not. And that is predicated on the acceptance by the string theory community that the astronomers have shown that there is uh, an isotropic component of the acceleration. Right. Yes, well, more specifically that the constant is actually positive as opposed to being neg negative. That's I think correct. That, that's what uh, gives the string theorists headaches. Is that's that right. They would prefer they it would was be, if, if it was negative, <laughs> they would be happy. So actually, as I tell my string theory friends, they have to, in any case, uplift to a, a, you know, to a positive cosmological constant, they could just as well uplift to zero because string theory has not addressed the cosmological constant problem per se, which we can come to later. And uh, it, I want to just emphasize that the interpretation of this as due to a cosmological constant, right, is simply based on measuring observables such as the luminosity distance or in other contexts, the angular diameter distance, and then interpreting Mm -hmm. this as due to vacuum energy or whatever. This is not what is written in the sky. These are all interpretations. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to make a clear distinction between what is measured and the interpretation. So, uh, and the, the result of your analysis is basically that you don't need uh, dark energy to explain uh, the observations that come from the supernova. So what's with all the other evidence for dark energy that people are so proud of? Indeed, uh, that is the first thing that uh, people say. So when you publish this paper, for example, Adam Rees, who is one of the Nobel laureates, um, you know, he criticized us publicly by saying there is a whole body of evidence. So, so to that, I have several things to say. First of all, I think it's a cultural issue. So as you are well aware, the standard model of particle physics is confirmed by a very large number of pieces of evidence, right? 
there is uh, something called a GFITTER plot, which shows at least 42 different data points, and they all agree perfectly with the standard model. Nevertheless, most of the communities engaged in an attempt to find some way beyond the standard model by finding one piece of data that doesn't fit. Hence, the interest in, for example, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon and or the anomalies that have been revealed in BDKs and so forth. Because that's the only way we know we are going to make progress, right? We are not going to be satisfied with just having a model that fits all the data because that does not allow any progress. However, in the cosmology community, I find for whatever reason that that is the status quo. They do not like the standard model to be questioned. That's the first thing. The second point is that all this confirmation of the standard model that was initially triggered by this uh, discovery of the acceleration is actually uh, somewhat superficial because most of it is done assuming the standard model of cosmology. So to give a, a explicit example, uh, for example, there is a phenomenon called baryon acoustic oscillations. So these are the analog of the uh, peaks that you see in the cosmic microwave background anisotropy. And this was actually remarked on long ago. In fact, when I first heard about them, they were called Sakharov oscillations. And they would have been very pronounced because at the time they didn't know about dark matter. If it, it would have been a purely baryonic universe and these uh, uh, features should have been very prominent. In fact, in today's universe, they should be extremely subtle. So the statement is that if I pick a galaxy and then if I draw a shell around it at some distance of order 150 megaparsecs, there should be a one percent over density of galaxies in that shell compared to the average. So we're looking for a one percent effect. And this we can look for in the so-called two-point correlation function or in the power spectrum and so on. Now, it is easy to figure out that in order to measure such an effect at this five sigma that I talked about earlier, you need to have several million galaxies, red shifts, measured precisely. Precisely means spectroscopically. Mm -hmm. There is a cheaper way to measure red shifts you call uh, photometric red shifts, where you just look at the galaxy through different bands. But if you don't have enough of those bands, and mm -hmm. to date we don't, uh, the measurement of the redshift has large uncertainty, so that's not good enough. So you might ask, uh, do we have this necessary data sam sample? And the answer is no. The first claim of the baryon acoustic oscillation peak was made using a sample of something like 40,000 so-called luminous red galaxies. Mm -hmm. How, you might ask, could you actually detect such a thing when you don't have the numbers? Answer is what I had told you earlier, you use the LCDM template. So you're actually answering a different question. You're not asking is there a peak somewhere or what are the odds for there being a peak from random fluctuation. You're asking is there a peak at the expected position for the standard cosmology. Right? And in fact, there had been analysis where no peak has been found, even with more data than the first one. Right? So if that sort of thing happens in particle physics, if you see a, initially a little bump at 125 GeV, and then you take three times more data and that has dropped in significance, you'd say it was a fluctuation. But cosmologists know this and they acknowledge that in any given sample, there's only a 10% chance of seeing the peak. So you have a rather uh, uncomfortable situation where of course you only publish something if you see the peak not if you don't. So there is a possibility of confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have only two things. I'm not trying to criticize any particular analysis in, in particular. All I'll say is that the same data that is considered to uh, be confirmation of uh, the standard model using baryon acoustic oscillations, it's also consistent with models where there is no acceleration. And this has been shown by Alan Blanchard and his collaborators. So that tells you about the statistical power of the data. So, so that would be if you only look at the baryon acoustic oscillations, but then usually the argument is if you also take into account the supernova data, 
um, that it speaks very strongly for lambda CDM. Indeed, but, and if you if combine you, if them. If you don't have the supernova data, yeah. then the baryon acoustic oscillations alone won't do it. Correct. Okay. So it's a matter of what's called concordance, or combining the data sets, and in particular, the cosmic microwave background also comes in there, mm -hmm. because that the position of the first acoustic peak provides a, a good measure of the global spatial curvature, which is close to zero. And therefore, uh, you infer from that that there must be something to make up uh, unity, because you're using the so-called cosmic sum rule, in which matter plus curvature plus the cosmological constant add up to one. And therefore, if you plot all these measures on a two-dimensional plot of the cosmological constant versus the matter, uh, then they pick out the standard cosmological model. So I have two comments about this. The cosmic microwave background fluctuations by themselves are insensitive to dark energy because they decoupled at a time when the universe was a thousand times smaller. And therefore, the cosmological constant was less important than matter by a factor of 1000 cube. The way that you infer dark energy from the cosmic microwave background is primarily by using this sum rule. Therefore, the conclusion is only as valid as the sum rule is valid. And the sum rule, I would remind you, is, was constructed for the simplest possible cosmological model, which has only these three components. So whereas I certainly agree that Within that simplified model, there appears to be concordance between different measures. My remark is that that concordance might be somewhat manufactured because there is, first of all, some confirmation bias, as I mentioned earlier. And one knows that many other techniques, which by themselves don't have the statistical power to give you a good measurement, are nevertheless consistent with uh, the standard model. So. Uh, it comes to mind that uh, Rupert Croft, who was a cosmologist, he did an analysis with a colleague of all the measurements of lambda that had been reported in the literature between the discovery in 1998 and something like 2011. And I think if I remember correctly, they said that of the 28 measurements that had been reported, only two were outside the one sigma bound of the W map. Uh, paper, right? WMAP was supposed to have made the most precise measurement. It was actually an inference, but even so. So, you know, by chance, you would expect at least a third of these to be outside the one sigma bound, right? But in fact, only two were. Now, they, in fact, said uh, that this sort of highlights the importance for what would be called blind analysis in cosmology. And I think many cosmologists are in agreement with that that uh, one should avoid any possibility of confirmation bias by doing blind analysis, but that has not been the case to date. Oh, sorry. But the good news is that uh, there is data on the horizon, for example, the recently commissioned dark energy spectroscopic instrument that will measure millions of red chips uh, using optical fibers and so on. And this is also important because there are direct tests of uh, lambda or dark energy which will actually measure whether it has this uh, negative pressure that is characteristic. And what that means is that the negative pressure stops the or slows down the formation of structure. It mm -hmm. fights gravity. Now, normally the cosmic microwave background uh, and the fluctuations are unaffected by what happens after the radiation decouples. But there is this exception called the late integrated sachs wolf effect which is that as the photons propagate towards us, they pass through inhomogeneities, so uh, both over densities and under densities, and to linear order, these cancel out. However, if lambda has come to dominate the universe, that would have been recently within a redshift of one, then the photons as they cross, the structures that are forming at that time, when they fall in and they climb out, the red shift and the blue shift don't cancel because in the interim, the gravitational potential has changed. And this should uh, reflect itself in a correlation between large scale structure and the cosmic microwave background. And this is the late ISW effect. And if you can detect it, that would be a very interesting direct test of lambda or something else that can do this like curvature. Now, 
there was an interesting paper by a cosmologist uh, Nyaya Shashodhi mm -hmm. many years ago. And he pointed out that this was a very interesting test, but you need 10 million redshifts to see this at 5 sigma. I've already told you that we are less than a tenth of that number, yet there are any number of papers that claim to have seen this effect. Oh. Okay. Because the significance of the detections are all below 3 sigma. Sometimes they add together uh, different attempts to do so and combine the covariances in a rather risky manner, I would say to try to get it above four sigma. Uh, but really, what we really need is more data. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I remember seeing some of these papers, uh, yes. seeing reports about it. So the bottom line, in my uh, opinion, is that this concordance is partly manufactured. Mm. And more to the point, it rests on the underlying assumption of a cosmological model that had its roots a century ago and which is very difficult to modify because ultimately, as you know well, exact solutions of Einstein's equations are very hard to find except in highly symmetric situations. So this model was constructed when there was no data and it is quite understandable that uh, Einstein and others assumed maximally symmetric situation to formulate the model. It's very hard to deviate from that because then the mathematics gets very complicated mm. and it is then harder to confront uh, any deviations from this model with the data. To You can do so in simple situations. So for example, there is the lemes tolman bondi model which drops the assumption of uh, homogeneity but preserves isotropy. It just allows for a radial variation. And that in itself is uh, enough to get rid of the evidence for acceleration from supernovae. But if you then ask me, uh, you know, we could be in a large void, there is astronomical evidence for that, and this could all be true. But then one would be unable to give you a worked out model for how the fluctuations grew from initial decoupling to the structures that we see today, if indeed we are in a LTB, locally LTB universe. So the great advantage of the standard model is precisely that by making all points in the universe equivalent and therefore equally special in some sense, they simplify the mathematics incredibly. Right? I recall meeting a well-known mathematical cosmologist, Krasinski, who has written a book on inhomogeneous and anisotropic cosmologies. And I remember I told him, I'm so glad I don't have to read your book because it was really very hard going. But in fact, I'm afraid uh, one might need to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, you also told me that this um, reanalysis that you did of the supernova data impacts this discussion about the tension in the Hubble rate? Well, that's right. So this actually is getting into the nitty gritty. So I said that the data was made public in the joint likelihood analysis uh, group and they did the community a big service. Now, subsequently, other uh, data has been released, but not in the same detail. Mm -hmm. So there is something called the Pantheon compilation, which added to the JLA catalog uh, another set of supernovae which were found in the so-called Panstar survey done from Hawaii, plus some others. And that has then increased the number above a thousand. And then there are other uh, catalogs from the Dark Energy Survey from uh, another survey uh, done by people from Harvard and so on. But most of these uh, are not provided uh, in the detail that we require. So as I mentioned earlier, we needed to undo the effects of the peculiar velocity corrections that have been made. These are not provided uh, separately for these catalogs and therefore we cannot do the exercise. And I do find it a bit unfair that we are then criticized as Adam Rees did for not using, quote, the latest data, which makes a, an impact on those who are not expert in the subject, uh, we would be very happy to use the latest data if it is made available. Right. So that uh, leads us to a situation where there are different catalogs. And then when you look at the existing catalogs, um, my collaborator Ramiz found that there are discrepancies between, for example, the JLA and the Pantheon catalogs. Lots of supernovae, the redshifts in the Pantheon catalog are different from those in the JLA catalog. Mm. 
to a level which is far bigger than the quoted uncertainty of the measurement. Yeah, I looked at the paper. Yeah. I, was, I was quite shocked, I have to say. And of course, uh, in the particle physics community, we are used to the idea that if you make some data public, you're responsible for the data and you entertain questions and any queries that people might have about using that. However, uh, Ramiz reports that he has been unsuccessful in getting satisfactory answers to why this data is discrepant. And the Hubble tension that you referred to uh, is based on the claim that there is a possibility of measuring the Hubble constant, as it is called, although it's of course not a constant, but you can measure it locally to a pretty high precision. Okay, initially it was 3%, now the claim is you can get to almost 1%. Mm. However, even when the first Hubble parameter, local Hubble constant measurement was done as a major project, it was called the Hubble Key Project, um, uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope. This was one of the flagship missions of the Hubble Space Telescope. And Wendy Friedman led this uh, collaboration. And they had only about, I think, 50 to 60 measurements of objects on the basis of which they determined the Hubble constant within about 30 megaparsecs of us, relatively locally. And this was looked at uh, later by uh, McClure and Dyer, I think. And they pointed out that uh, if you looked on the sky, there was a something of order 7%, I think, variation in the Hubble constant in different directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this was, uh, I mean, in a sense, it would not be unexpected if you really are living in a highly inhomogeneous universe where the rate of expansion reflects the local matter density. The point I'm simply making is that if you want to claim that you can make a one person measurement, you'll have to explain how you account for those seven percent deviations and how you correct for them. Perhaps part of it can be corrected using models of peculiar flows and so mm -hmm. forth, but you need to do it to that precision. Yeah, and, I'm, I'm trying to calculate in my head huh. um, how the seven percent relate to the observed tension between the Planck measurement and just the Just make it go away. It would just make it, it totally will, go it away. It would be within yeah, the uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our point is simply that it is premature to claim a Hubble tension mm. because there are still systematic uncertainties in the supernova data. What has now happened is those local measurements using the local distance ladder have been married to extend it using the supernova data. But depending on which supernova catalog is used, we get a different answer for the inferred <laughs> Hubble parameter. And uh, what was pointed out is that uh, the inferred Hubble parameter uh, jumps by enough mm -hmm. to uh, remove this so-called tension that has uh, in fact been called a crisis for cosmology. Uh, so this to me reflects a rather disturbing fact, which is that the analysis of the data is rather uh, specialized. Very few people know how to handle these catalogs to go into the details of how the error corrections have been done, the covariances and so forth. And it's largely a black box, unless you spend time doing this. And somewhat to my surprise, uh, it is understandable, of course, that the particle physics community, which has a great interest in the outcome, nevertheless is not really able to uh, assess the evidence to this degree of detail. Mm -hmm. right? But I am a bit surprised that even in the astronomical community, there has been far less, in my opinion, critical assessment of the procedures being used than they should have been. And because in fact, um, the fact that these discrepancies are there is on record. We have not had any satisfactory response and the situation continues. Mm. This, so this so what one gets this impression what could have happened there is that there were some rather basic mistake in, in some of the data analysis and then people built stuff on top of it, right? It could well be. I mean, one would rather hear it from the people who actually put the data there because mm -hmm. they are the people who really know. But certainly uh, there are some trivial errors in another uh, web page where the Pantheon catalog is listed. We have pointed out that the columns which show the redshifts in the heliocentric frame and the ones in the CMB frame are actually identical. That was clearly some kind of a typo. It has not been corrected over a year later. It's still there. And the our concern really is that meanwhile, a lot of people pick up these catalogs uncritically and use them mm -hmm. to publish papers, which then say 
well, the universe is exactly isotropic or whatever, <laughs> not realizing that the data sets that they're using uh, do need closer attention. So a lot of uh, misinformation is being propagated and this is not very healthy. So it's, it's a big mystery that I guess will, you know, haunt us for a little longer. Um, I think that's a good place to um, wrap up. So I would like to thank you very much for your time uh, and for this interesting conversation. And thank you everybody for watching. See you next week.